Ten years ago, I was riding my horse and went completely blind out of my right eye. I'm a naturopathic doctor, so I went into my big clinic and something was really wrong. And um, everything looked pixelated and I lost the ability to see the colour red and I felt like absolute crap warmed up. Because I was in a big uh, clinic, I went and saw the doctor. They said it was post-migranous and absolutely nothing to worry about. I started to So they said it was what? A post-migraine aura post -migraine. change. So migraine headaches a lot of times cause visual auras or visual narrowing or loss of uh, a blind, blind spot in the eye. So that was the easy diagnosis. Yeah, and then I started walking into walls um, and then I would be sitting with patients and I would ask them if they wanted a glass of water but it would come out, do you have an ice cream in your hand? Like I, my words were completely all over the place. And then I had severe vertigo, so I was dropping like a fly and then my walking got quite affected. Um, but because I had an amazing group of practitioners working with me, I sat with my chiro and my osteo and we thought it was probably likely to be multiple sclerosis. So, so slow down, because th this is an accent for these people. They're, they're struggling. Here. <laughs> so let me see if I could reframe this for you. Sure. So she's having all these neurological conditions, yes? Yeah. Can't see out of her eye, then she can't coordinate, she's walking into walls. Um, she, she's, she's physically uh, having neurological symptoms. And when they finally do the tests, they find out that she has multiple sclerosis, MS, which is a big diagnosis. And so if you're having problems speaking like that, that kind of aphasia, that kind of loss of speech usually means there's something in the language center of your brain, you know, like a stroke or a lesion. So that probably led them to do further diagnostics to determine if she had some more progressive condition and the diagnosis was multiple sclerosis. Well, it didn't actually. It was the, it was my, the people, my chiros that were like, it was that. So I had to jump up and down to get an MRI. It took me a month to get anyone to take me seriously. And then I got a phone call. Oh yeah, you do have MS. So <laughs> well, she wound up with MS diagnosis. <laughs> yeah. So, um, being a naturopath, I decided to attack it matter to matter, so I refused to take the drugs. I was really stressed at the time. I had Australia's biggest natural therapies clinic and working banana hours, so I sold my natural therapies clinic, wound back uh, my private practice a little bit, and the matter to matter worked sort of because I did become a slightly different person, and that was pretty good for six years. I was trekking into Everest and doing a whole pile of things, and um, I met Dr. Joe in 2016, and I was not too bad when I saw you, but I was moving back into the same personality that created the MS, which is the crazy workaholic. Um, and, not, <laughs> and I started my meditations, and I worked on my career. And I, I never did any meditations about having MS. I didn't even look at my health. Everything I did was about furthering my career. <laughs> I just, I find that so hilarious now. So I spent, and you know, that was great until I was working again, 14 hours a day, seven days a week, like a crazy person. And in 2017, I was training to do a um, huge hike in um, Nepal up Mira Peak and I was carrying a 25 kilo pack in Tasmania in the wilderness and my walking went and I started to have um, quite severe ataxia, so I couldn't walk further than maybe five minutes without looking like a complete drunk person. Um, so then I had a limp, then I lost bladder control, then I lost bowel control, then every time I rode my horse, when I would get off, I couldn't walk. And I let this go for probably eight weeks and ignored it. <laughs> Until my chiropractor told me that um, potentially it was a medical emergency and I may have had something called quarter equina, and um, she convinced me to go into emergency. Um, at about the same time, Dr Joe was due to come back out to Australia and I promised Paula that I would help her out and I got checked into hospital two weeks before. So I thought, I have to get out of hospital. So I spent two weeks in a hospital bed and I hadn't had an MRI because I would sort of ignored everything and they MRI'd me and my... Lesion load had gone from five in the brain and two in the spinal cord to 40 in the brain, 20 in the spinal cord with a 5% um, communication going. I also had a slipped disc from a horse riding injury and I had um, 
a, a, almost a, a, well, I had a partial um, compression and herniation on the disc. I had no feeling in my legs and numbness on my feet. All right, let me stop you right here. This is a common problem uh, with people in our community. They have symptoms, they have a diagnosis, they have some type of health uh, problem, and they deny it. And they hope that by not paying attention to it, they could push through it and get well. So they put their attention on their career, on something else, because they don't want to look at it because then they have to stop everything that they're addicted to doing and address it. You understand what I'm talking about, yes? And, and it's, it's common because nobody really wants to look down that tunnel because it, once you acknowledge that you have a condition, then, you know, then you, have, you have all the beliefs that go along with it. So a lot of people just shut the door and they just try to move through it and hope that it's gonna go away. But with something like MS, you know, the, uh, the stress hormones accelerate uh, the lesions. So when you have all those lesions in the brain and in the, in the spinal cord, uh, they're competing for space in the spinal cord, and so they start to occupy a lot of space, and like an hourglass, they start to compress the spinal cord, and now information that's traveling down that fiber optic cable from the brain down the spine through those spinal nerves, literally being compressed, and so the loss of neurological activity past that point is causing it to have loss of bladder control, loss of bowel control, she's having difficulty walking. There's, a, there's a, 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 a lack of communication between the brain and the body. And so <clears throat> when, with, with, when this happens with MS uh, and you have that many lesions, in the normal situation, the diagnosis is that you'll ultimately be on steroids for the rest of your life and you'll be in a wheelchair. That's what they'll probably tell you uh, because the progression in a normal situation is usually just things just can tend, tend to get worse. Go ahead. That's exactly right. I had the amount of guilt I had around being a naturopath and having MS was, you have no idea. So I just put it over there and shelved it and it's focused on... It's not convenient. On, it's not, yes, it was really inconvenient. I'm a super active mountain climbing horse riding person and MS didn't fit into my model of reality. So, <laughs> um, they told me again that I was super irresponsible and that I needed to go on drugs and I decided that I would check myself out of the hospital and dragged myself across to the progressive. And that was the first time I ever did a meditation in the tuning into new potentials. I did a big H and started healing. First time ever. <laughs> <laughs> so um, from there, I did start to get a little bit better. I decided not to do any, like I say, medication. I meditated for four to six hours every day and really became aware of how addicted I was to the hormones of stress and some really heavy belief patterns about self-worth. Um, then we did Carbo Dreamtime and I got there. I almost had to have a wheelchair coming off the playing to that event and it was hot which as anyone with MS knows the heat slows down uh, neural activity so I was dragging my body around at that event um, but I had a coherence healing and okay wait let me just interrupt you here again it's my party <laughs> <laughs> in the first events follow-up that we did in Cabo San Lucas it was the first dream time event that we did now nobody knew what was going on I took a big chance you know because the moment you mess with people's sleep, you know, they're not the nicest people in the world. <laughs> and so I had a lot of sincere people They had no idea what was about to happen and I dropped the bomb that we were going to be going through the night and the first night, you know, I was up, you know, I stay awake the whole time. I'm on the audio riser with, uh, with the team back there and I, it's three o'clock in the morning and I say to those guys, I got to go for a walk. Like, what's wrong? I go, well, if where you place your attention is where you place your energy, they're throwing daggers at me. Because they're angry, and when you feel anger, who are you going to direct it towards? The guy you think is doing it. So I was just like, oh, my God, i got to get out of here. <laughs> and then they started breaking through. They, we go through the night. They have the whole day to rest. We meet at 3 o'clock, and then this is when I started working with groups to do this coherence healing that you're going to learn that has healed so many people. And so we started the process uh, at that event, and people were so out of their box. They were so outside of convention 
so outside of their routine that they didn't expect anything. They just followed instructions, and we had so many crazy healings uh, take place that surprised, all, surprised me, surprised all of us because we were on to something. And, and so uh, Fiona was one of the people that um, participated in the, in the healing. So I just want to frame it for those people who don't know anything about it. Yeah, and that was the t start of the turning point for me. I went home and I walked off the plane, no problems. Normally a long flight back to Australia would really um, muck me around and people started commenting on how well I was looking. I did drop back into my old program and went into back into my work patterns and it, you know, it sort of wavered, but I was really consistent with my meditations and, and so I was sort of holding things. I had another MRI and my lesion load had reduced. And my neurologist said, oh, the medication's working. And I said, yeah, I never took the medication. <laughs> and bless him, he said, well, whatever you're doing is working. I don't care what you're doing. Keep doing it. They always say that now. Then we had Santa Fe, which is an amazing event. I was um, running the activity course and we were out like this all day, but it was the most humbling, beautiful experience, anyone in Santa Fe watching you guys go through that and just watching people overcome themselves and I just realised that I just had to pull my finger out of my... and really overcome myself as well. Then we had Cancun. Um, and I had been progressively getting better and better. Um, you know, I could walk further without too much ataxia, but I was still running this really stressful company. I was still there was still some addiction to the hormones of stress. And then we got to Cancun and <laughs> Cancun was amazing. On the, today, it was this day in Cancun, I was out watching you all do the walking meditation and I was in tears the, and it was the same the thing this morning. Just watching you all do that, my heart burst open. Then we got into this meditation that we're about to do right now and I lit up like a Christmas tree. I had so much energy coming through my body that at the end of the meditation, Dr. Joe was like, everybody come back into the room, and I was on the floor convulsing like a, a crazy person. So I spent half an hour before I could get up. Then the next morning, we... You understand that's energy yeah. moving through her nervous system. You understand that, yes? And when the divine awakens in a person and energy starts to move through the nervous system, it... it it finds blocks, it can't, if there's a block, it has to move through it. And so when it starts to move through those blocks, even in connective tissue, the body involuntarily is trying to process a frequency that's carrying information. So the body's trying to reorganize information and we see this all the time. It's, um, it's, uh, you can control it, but why would you want to? Because you know that something unusual is happening and you just have to keep surrendering to it. And she started surrendering to it more and it got, the more she surrendered to it, the more she relaxed into it, the more coherent it got. She wasn't resisting it. But she forgot to tell you that in Cancun, when she was a team leader, I bring the team leaders in before we start the event, and I have a nice talk with them, <laughs> a very nice talk with them. And then they sit up and they do the breath, and I put them into a meditation and I watch. And she went for it 100% in that meditation, and she, she cracked. And as soon as I saw that, I thought, I thought, oh, she's going to have a great week. Then we did the pineal gland, or as us Australians like to say, pineal gland, meditation the next morning. And it, again, I was, the breath, I was cracked wide open. As soon as we lay down and we did the lying down breath, it was the second breath. I don't know how to explain it, but those four metabolites that come out of the pineal five. gland. Five. They do they do everything that he talks about. I, my body was fast asleep. I couldn't move anything. I couldn't have an analytical thought. There was nothing. I couldn't make my brain do anything. I felt so in love with everything. I felt completely in this weird space. And then I opened my eyes and this massive kaleidoscope came in front of me and it wasn't a 2D thing, it was a 3D with lights and a I'm fractal like, pattern. it was huge, it took up the whole room and I was like, yes. <laughs> so I decided to surrender into it, I went straight through the middle of it and where I was lying in the ballroom, the next thing I was lying in another spot in the ballroom and I opened my eyes 
and I could see this beautiful amber energy over me and I knew straight away it was my coherence field. And I was like, because you can't have an analytical thought, I was like, oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> and as soon as I said that, a hand came over the side of it and touched it and it went warm, 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 warm and it started to vibrate and then... I don't know how to describe it because I've never felt anything like it, but an electricity went through my body and I broke into cells and everything vibrated for probably the rest of the meditation. I was able to get out of my body and walk around the room. I was following team leaders around. I could see everything that was going on and then I was back in feeling the vibration. And then it, it was... Uh, I, there's no words. It was amazing. Then we went and had breakfast and came back into the room and Dr. Joe was on stage and he does this to me. <laughs> and, I, and you said, you said your coherence field has changed. And I said, did someone tell you about my meditation? And he was like, well, I can see it, babe. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so then that we had the second pineal gland meditation and this, I had the same experience, but this time rather than my whole coherence field, I could see um, every single one of my energy centres and I could see the coherence field in each energy centre and I had the same experience. And then when I got back from Cancun, I was after that. That was my thing. So I just ploughed through about 15 books of... I read all the master's teachings. I went through as much as I could. I was studying I gave her this. a reading list. Yeah. And I was dutiful. I, I powered through the reading list. I was doing six hours a day. And I had probably five or six more massive meditations like that. I had some really crazy stuff, and my health started to significantly jump at that stage. I quit my job. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. I quit my job, changed my relationships. I just, anything that I decided wasn't working for me, I just quit it. And I am in so the unknown. I have no idea what I'm doing anymore. I'm just <laughs> turning up to wherever I need to be, and I'm so excited. <laughs> Couple things here. Uh, number one, uh, she used to have a very noticeable gait. She dragged her left hip around. I watched her. She had a, a compromise in the way she walked with her legs, uh, uh, the way she looked with her eyes. Uh, and all of those physical things have disappeared for her. And if I'm going to encourage her to get an MRI just for the sake of science. I've got one after Brighton. After she's Brighton. Getting, she's yeah. getting one in November. Yeah. It's a good scientific experiment, yes? Yeah. So number, point number two. Those pineal metabolites that I'm going to review with you tomorrow in detail, they're derivatives of melatonin, as I talked about, that will create very powerful, very powerful uh, healing agents, anti-cancer, anti-aging, anti-inflammatory, anti-neurodegenerative. Uh, those, those are the very elixirs that begin to t switch on the immune system because MS is an immune-mediated condition. And nobody knows the etiology, the cause of it, but what, what, when the immune system switches back on, then the body moves back into homeostasis. So by her going for it to that measure and activating her pineal gland, she had the full package deal. She had the, the uh, antioxidants, the upgraded versions of melatonin. She had the, the benzodiazepines, the Valium chemicals that anesthetize the analytical mind so the neocortex shuts down. You're still conscious, but you're not coming from your thinking analytical brain. She's got all the chemicals that are causing her body to move into stasis. She's, she's in the present moment and her body is in stasis. It's not moving. Uh, she's got the electricity going on in her nervous system, that, that amplitude, the same chemical found in, a, in an electric eel, <laughs> switching on. The, 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 the chemicals that create that stasis, there's the caterpillar becoming the butterfly. There's a metamorphosis taking place on a cellular level. Are you with me still? That's in your brain. It's in your brain. And you say to me, well, I take plant medicine, you know, ayahuasca. Well, you know... You take that, if, if, if those chemicals fit into the receptor sites in your brain, then there's chemicals that your brain would manufacture already. The same chemicals, they wouldn't be there if the receptor sites weren't there, if the, the chemical wasn't made in the brain. Are you with me still? And then it makes that profound chemical 
that begins to open the doors to dimension. And so now she has the chemical that's causing her to see, not with her eyes, but whatever that is. She's picking up information. And, she, and the experience is so real that the experience is having a dramatic effect on her nervous system. Are you with me still? And once her nervous system starts processing that frequency because the pineal gland crystals are tuning in, oscillating to information, she's now drawing energy into her nervous system from the field and that frequency is carrying information. So once it makes it into the body, the pineal signals the pituitary. The pituitary releases oxytocin and vasopressin. Oxytocin, you're gonna feel a lot of love. You're gonna feel grateful. And the moment you feel love and gratitude, you're in a state of receiving. The second field comes in, pituitary releases vasopressin, the cells like a sponge fill up with water, now they can facilitate a faster frequency. Water is the conduit. So now the cell can take on a faster frequency. Now the cells start vibrating and she feels it in every cell in her body. And the coherence that the nervous system is processing in a faster frequency we would only call love, a cr tremendous amount of electricity. And it's, it's coming not from any other way but from her connection to energy. And energy, then, is healing the body. Are you with me still? So then those microtubules in the cells, they're like guitar strings. They, they, they pick up frequency. But for most people, they're vibrating at the, at the frequency of matter. And they're emitting a very low frequency of light. And as the stress hormones get involved, the cells start diminishing light and the incoherent signature begins to cause cells not to be able to communicate because the expression of incoherent light in the cell is disease. That's research. So now all of a sudden she's getting a biological upgrade. The frequency is turning into a change in chemistry. At the same time, the microtubules are vibrating now at a faster frequency, and now they're emitting more coherent light and information, and as they start vibrating at a faster frequency, if all disease is a lowering of frequency and an incoherent signature, in one second, her body literally is changing, and it's energy that does that. When I ask my team leaders to be team leaders, they gotta know, the, they gotta know they'll be prepared for me to ask them any question. They have, to, they have to be able to answer any question that I ask them. And I threaten them a little bit. And they don't want to be embarrassed. So what they do is they study. And she studied. She listened to my books on, you know, on tape, and then she put it on a faster speed. She listened to it over and over again, over and over. She's piecing the model together. She's understanding it. She's got questions. She's building it. She's tearing it down. She's rebuilding it up again. She's studying. The, why is she doing that? because she's assigning meaning to what she's doing. Her meditations mean more because she understands what she's doing. And I knew that when I started talking to her that she was, she was gonna go. I knew it. I knew that she was gonna have that type of transformation because then she read all my books two or three times, four times, she listened to them on tape, half awake, half asleep, and then I gave her a whole reading list of really cool books. She started reading those, she's asking me questions, and now she's not thinking about anything else but how to build the biggest model she possibly can for the greatest experience. Now, the cool thing about her at this point is the door's open. She doesn't have to try. She even actually doesn't try at all. She's just as open to whatever happens. I chose her to stand up and talk because there's many people in this audience that are struggling with MS many people that are struggling with neurodegenerative diseases. When we were in Cancun, we got a lady up that had, that had Parkinson's. She didn't even know anything about me. Amazon act accidentally sent You Are the Placebo to her. She threw it on her table. How many people were there? They'll, they'll, they'll tell you, right? She threw it on her table. She was like, I don't know what the hell this book is. And then she opened up to the colored pictures and there was a thing on Parkinson's. The person was healed of Parkinson's. She started reading, and she's like, I'm going. <laughs> and next thing you know, she's on the stage, you know, healed the Parkinson's. I mean, I mean you've got to understand that you, we just need one person. You see, it's in the field now, yes? yes. That frequency is in the field because it's happened, yes? yes? The observer is recording that. She's made known some unknown experience called healing MS that's outside of convention outside of normal or natural. She's in the realm of the supernatural. And you gotta scratch your head and say, wow, she's a little weird, but she did it. <laughs> she talks a little funny and she did it. 
And she was on, she's on her journey. But when I sat down with her for the, for the dinner on Sunday night with my, with my staff and my team leaders and volunteers, I sat next to her and I just looked her in the eye. I didn't say anything. And she just looked at me and she said, you know, I know I'm healed. I don't know how to tell you. I just know. I just know. I don't worry about it. I know I'm healed and I'm going to change my life now because I'm not going back. Now, she'll tell you that she doesn't know exactly what's going on in her life, but she's creating. I know what she's creating. She's got a, a plan. She's got a plan to contribute. And because she's so intoxicated by the truth that she doesn't want to do anything else but contribute to give back in some way. And now she can take all the years of experience and begin to realize that she doesn't have to be stressed and that she can be loved and respected and nurtured and she can make a difference. And that's what she's working on. She's working on not going back and falling asleep in the dream where you're unconscious. She's waking up in her future and she wants to stay there. And that's where her attention and energy is now. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>